So let's talk exploding vehicles and battle shock, artillery command points and conversion weapons, with six more core rule mechanics for 10th edition that Games Workshop have confirmed. Hello and welcome back to Warspets Tactics, where today I thought it was high time for a roundup of further 40k core rules changes that Games Workshop have shown us. Over the past week or so, they do seem to have been dropping really quite a lot of little bits of information scattered among their faction previews. Most of the time it's just been little asides that confirm one thing or another, or tell us how a new weapon type works. I maybe talked about some of them very briefly in passing, but I thought we'd do a bit of a roundup now and talk about the actual implications of the reveals. Let's jump in then and talk about six areas of the rules that Games Workshop have clarified. First up, and a little aside at the end of the recent World Eaters preview, was Destroyed Transports and Battle Shock. So far we have been told about some positives of transports in 10th edition, particularly the ability to get out after the transport has moved, which is great for pinging units onto objectives, and the Land Raiders Assault Ramp looks pretty fearsome for delivering melee troops. In this one though, they've confirmed that there's one thing that makes transports a bit worse than before, and it seems that it's another way that they're using their Battle Shock rules by units shaken from having their rides shot out from under them. In Games Workshop's own words, units forced to disembark when their ride goes boom are automatically battle shocked that turn. In terms of the feel of the rule, I feel like that's really quite fluffy. If you have your transports just wrecked by an anti-tank weapon, you're probably going to be a bit shell-shocked while you're trying to get your squad back together, rather than just a seamless disembarkation as it is now. I'd guess it'd probably still be paired with the rule that we have at the moment for the chance to lose models when they disembark. That rule seems to work fairly well, I think. Currently roll a dice for each model in the unit, and for each one you lose a miniature. For the Battle Shock rule, usually it will be destroyed during the enemy turn, and I am kind of curious as to whether or not they'll just auto-regroup in your own command phase, as is implied by the Battle Shock teaser preview that they showed us, or whether or not Battle Shock units will have to take a further leadership test to try and regroup. If so, I guess it means that the unit that got pinned down from their transport blowing up might be pinned for a little bit longer and be ineffective for a turn further. If they just automatically regroup at the start of your command phase, then I can't see this rule having an enormous amount of effect. For the most part, objectives don't matter too much, seeing as you usually score those at the end of your command phase rather than the start. Falling back restrictions shouldn't matter till after your command phase. And I guess besides certain unit abilities, like the Corn Berserker's Blood Surge one that they mentioned, the main effect will be to limit stratagems on that unit that's just had an exploded transport. Say for example, if they got charged you wouldn't be able to combat interrupt in the enemy's assault phase, and I guess you wouldn't be able to access things like durability stratagems to make them tougher. I feel like that rule kind of makes sense to be honest. They may be unlikely to be coordinated with quite so many fancy manoeuvres while they're trying to negotiate their way out of a burning wreck, whether or not you have to test to regroup or not. I think it is kind of fun that a dead transport basically shakes the contents for the rest of your turn. Seems like a fairly intuitive application of their battle shock rule there. Next up, and a fairly big reveal, was the rules for indirect fire in 10th edition. These ones were previewed along with the Sisters of Battle Exorcist in their preview. Generally speaking, indirect fire is something that's worth paying a bit of a premium for, in 9th edition at least. This is just very helpful to be able to target whatever unit you most need to, regardless of whether or not they're hiding behind a big ruin. For the armies that do have efficient indirect fire support, they can be quite nice for targeting enemy objective campers, perhaps fragile enemy damage dealers that are easy to kill but will kill a lot if they get the first strike, or potentially just shaving off the last wound or two off something that's really dangerous, and if you can't quite kill it, it's going to cause problems next turn. It still looks like obscuring terrain is going to be very much a thing, so I can't imagine that indirect fire support is going to be any less important. It seems that the way that they're going with this for 10th edition is keeping a rule that's kind of similar in scope to the 9th edition nerf that it got, Basically, when Games Workshop undercosted a whole bunch of their indirect fire support, rather than fixing the individual units, they decided that it would be better to nerf it in general for the game. Basically meaning that it fires on full effect if you can see the target, but if you can't see the target, effectively it's minus one to hit, and the enemy gets their saving throw improved by one. The rule is kind of similar in 10th edition, though has been tweaked in a couple of subtle ways. Arguably, I'd say that indirect fire might have got slightly better due to this. First up, it gives you a minus one to hit for your weapon now, rather than worsening the ballistic skill. That means that presuming 10th edition is still keeping the cap on stacks modifiers, if you already had a minus one to hit for some reason, the indirect fire shouldn't make that any worse. It looks like in at least the single example of indirect fire that we have so far with the exorcist, that one appears to be paired with the heavy keyword, so if that sits stationary, it'll still be hitting on a 3+. plus. This bit of artillery at least gets a bit more inaccurate on the move, which I feel like is kind of fluffy. It was a bit weird for things like guard basilisks to be able to move around the table really quite quickly, still popping off shells to full effect. 
The other change that it's had is now that instead of getting an improvement to their saving throw, you now get the benefit of cover on the unit. Again, basically the same thing in a lot of circumstances, as that's now plus one to your save. But again, it means it won't stack with certain other special rules. Say if you target an enemy unit that's already in cover, it won't get any worse for you because you're firing indirect, as they already have that bonus. It also can be counteracted by any barrage weapons that get the ignore cover special rule. It seems that the Exorcist Conflagration rockets get that, so they're heavy, so get to ignore the minus one to hit, and are ignores cover, so get to ignore the benefit of cover. Still though, seeing as they're only strength 5, AP 0, and damage 1, it's not going to be the most overpowered thing in the world, I think. In general, due to those modifiers, it looks like the barrage weapons will still favour armies with slightly better ballistic skill. Guard getting a minus one to hit, for example, is a bit more painful than a ballistic skill 3 plus army. Though I guess it's possible that just about every single barrage weapon in the game might get paired with heavy. I feel like the two rules do kind of make sense together, basically evening out to be less accurate on the move. It does appear that on the one example that we have as well, the range has been decreased a bit. The Exorcist is now only 36 inches rather than 48. Maybe there could be a bit more of a trend to these big gun type weapons not being able to reach the entire map. I guess that's one of the things that makes them a bit less interactive. Ignores line of sight firepower combined with really long ranges due to that being how artillery works in the real world. And you wind up with a unit that just wants to sit in the corner and shoot whatever it likes. Overall, I don't really think that the core mechanics of this matter maybe quite as much as how much the individual units cost. With or without these rules, I feel like Games Workshop could create balanced artillery. It just depends on the points cost that you pay for the damage output. Generally speaking, if artillery ever does get too cheap, then it gets spammed very, very easily, just removing entire chunks of the opponent's army without much interaction. So hopefully they still get the balance right, charging it at a premium so you don't want to spam it too much, but having the utility of just being able to kill the exact thing that you most need to can be worth the extra cost. Next up, we had confirmation of a fairly important non-change, where command point regeneration is still going to be capped at 1 per battle round, a change that was brought in mid-8th edition, when a lot of armies were going rather wild with the various warlord traits and relics and things to gain more CP. You could sometimes be spending stratagems and gain more CP back than when you spent them occasionally. I did suspect that this rule was probably going to be staying when we saw some of the unit previews. The Swarm Lord just flat out gains you an extra CP per turn, Abaddon the Despoiler will get you one each time you do a Dark Pact on a 2+, again that one looks very easy to do. And we've seen a few squad upgrades that regenerate them, things like the Voxcaster and the Leagues of Votan Hearthkin Radio. Basically it means that these sort of characters are going to kind of have diminishing returns, it'll be massively valuable to have one of them in your army and potentially generate 5 CP over the course of a game. But if your faction does have the option for two such characters, it won't make much sense to take a second one, as that bit of their rules will be kind of redundant. Given that we know that command points in general are going to be starting on zero CP, these sort of mechanics that get you more will be super valuable, I think. Command points are the sort of things where the first ones that you get are super, super valuable, and if you have absolutely lows, they get a bit slightly diminishing returns, just as then you can afford to spend CP on weaker stratagems that are less pivotal, if you happen to have loads. It does seem though that even if you capped at just regenerating one of them, it would pair well with the multiple different ways that you can get free stratagems. This one does seem to be a major datasheet rule of 10th. We've seen lots of characters so far that basically say that you can use a stratagem this phase for free. Say one of Gilliman's command abilities if he chooses to pass up the massive extra double oath a moment. Space Marine Captain's core ability, so I'd guess that might proxy to a bunch of the other commanders out there. Or things like the Terminator Squad's rapid ingress. These ones won't count as regenerating a CP, as you basically aren't, you just don't spend them in the first place because the stratagem costs zero CP. So effectively this could be another way that you could get a lot more free command points that gets around the 1 CP regen limit. It even looks like really pivotal mechanics such as the League of Votan Detachment rule where they have to kill an enemy unit to gain some command points, that one will have an exemption to the cap. I feel like between all these, command points perhaps aren't going to be quite as hard to come by as it looked like they might be earlier in 10th. Seems like most armies very much aren't just going to be spending 10 CP and you're done, with so many options to either spend stratagems completely for free, or just to generate extra ones over the course of the game. Looks like even with a limited pool of stratagems, you'll be able to spend quite a few of them. Next up, and from the Votan preview, we got told about conversion weapons and beam weapons in 40k. Basically, these new rules for the exotic conversion weapons, and a fairly strong hint that these beam type mechanics that we've seen throughout 9th might just generally not be a thing anymore. Conversion beamers are kind of rare exotic technology when they crop up. They often tend to be on forge world weapons back from the Age of Darkness. 
Things like the Acastus Knight or the Moirax Knight and some of their Dreadnought classes can pack them too. The Leagues of Votan are another faction that get access to them, and we got shown off their new rules for their conversion beam lasers, both off their Brockier Thunderkin and their Hecaton Land Fortress. In 9th edition, conversion weapons were handled a bit differently for the Imperium and the Votan, but in general they often tended to get better strength and AP at longer range, though it seems that the Votan weapons might well be trading it out for some of these core weapon keywords that we've seen from the main book. The Votan SP conversion weapons now have a conversion rule, which means that they get a critical hit on a 4+, plus if they're greater than half range away, and then that's paired with the sustained hits D3 rule, which basically gets you D3 extra hits on the target, provided you've got a critical hit, Normally that would be a 6, but if you've got that conversion rule, it would be a 4+, plus. so basically every hit that they get under normal circumstances. It's really quite a big boost, just slightly under double damage at half range, due to the sustained hit still happening on 6s, but still it very much seems like it fits the law. Conversion weapons are far better if they have a little bit further to build up their momentum. At the same time as this though, it does look like things like the beam weapon type profiles in 9th edition might be entirely gone. I guess the Leagues of Votan were perhaps the most notable users of these, they literally had a class of weapons called beam weapons, where you could potentially skewer multiple units with their long lines, and then hit multiple squads at once. But there really were quite a lot of other places in the game where it came up, a fair few psychic powers that tended to be kind of terrible, plus a few snazzy relic pistols like Mortarian's one and Dante's. It's early days yet, and Games Workshop does like to create some special mechanics for quite a few things in-game, but it seems at least possible that beam weapons are basically entirely gone. The Votan weapons didn't get it at all. And I feel like if they were creating a basic keyword for beam weapons in the big rulebook, the Votan weapons would almost certainly make use of it, as it's their whole thing. My guess from that is that that mechanic where you draw a line between one target and another and hit everything along the path will probably be kind of rare or completely gone. I think it's maybe not the biggest loss in the world though, it sometimes was a slightly awkward mechanic in terms of wording, and I felt like it was a hard rule to balance maybe, a lot of the weapons that had it tended to be really really weak, though the positioning and things of it could be kind of fun. Next up we had a reveal of something that a lot of people kind of suspected but we hadn't had confirmed yet, and that's that units that have OC0 won't be able to hold unclaimed objectives. This was my guess for how it was going to work, I was expecting that you'd probably need at least one point of objective control to take an objective, though it wasn't impossible that the objective control stat would just be for holding your objective against the opponent, and it might not stop you taking it if you were completely unopposed. It basically does doubly confirm that Battleshock is going to be super meaningful for taking and losing points, it's definitely going to be relevant for units scrapping over central objectives, although reducing units to objective control zero might make it just a little bit more unreliable for chaff units to hold backfield objectives, as often seems to be the fashion at the moment. Quite a lot of armies might have some sort of equivalent of Chaos Cultists or some Orc Gretchen maybe. Units that don't cost a lot of points and meaning that you can have most of your army pushing up to the front line. They won't do much for damage and defence, but literally all they need to do is sit on the point and hold it, and their job is done. Holding an objective with a unit like that could be kind of risky, particularly if your opponent has got some way of handing out Battleshock to a very long range, say for example the turn when the Tyranids get Shadow in the warp, your unit on the home objective might suddenly decide they're too scared to hold it. It does seem that as the datasheets have rolled out, there's going to be several options for sticky objectives in 10th edition. A few base units seem to have it, such as the Leagues of Votan Hearthkin Warriors, Plus we've seen it on another couple of special rules, things like that stratagem for the World Eaters, where if you lose a unit on the objective, you can dedicate the objective to Corn, and it's going to remain yours until the enemy actually manages to move up and take it. It's basically like planting a flag in that objective, and the opponent needs to come and take it down, and can't just shoot your units to get rid of you. I feel like as well as giving you the tactical ability to move off the objective if it makes more sense, this one could also be super relevant for, say, a troop squad on a backfield objective, Say for example, if you are holding a home field objective with a Leagues of Votan Hearthkin unit, then that unit suddenly gets battleshocked, the objective is still going to be under your control unless your opponent is dead close, just due to the special rule that they've got. It does seem some handy enough objective defence against units handing out battleshock at longer range. Finally, and this one from the Demons preview, we got some clarifications as to how you select melee weapons and the extra attacks rule. I believe in one of their other previews, Games Workshop had confirmed that you can usually fire with all your ranged weapons, though I suspect that pistols will remain being an exception to that. That led at least a few people to think that you might be able to fight with literally all of the melee weapons that you had equipped, perhaps causing a bit of a stir for at least a few people who saw the Gilliman datasheet and then thought you'd be able to attack with both the strike mode and the sweep mode of his attacks. I think it was obvious enough to most people that you weren't going to be fighting with both eight really strong attacks and also chasing it down with far more anti-horde attacks, 
so it did give us a clue that you'd only be able to pick one melee weapon if the model in question happens to be armed with two different ones. In general it looks like for paired melee weapons and things, like say a couple of lightning claws, that's just listed as one profile now. Lightning claws that seem to have gained the twin links rule. For the units that do strike with a primary weapon and then get some bonus attacks to follow it down, Games Workshop seem to have found themselves the pretty intuitively named extra attacks rule, kind of similar to the demon's malefic weapons that they had in 9th edition. Get these attacks in addition to your primary melee profile, and you can only ever make the number of attacks listed on the datasheet here, you can't increase it by other means. We've seen this on the Great Unclean One's Bioblade little dagger. That gets to attack with another 3 attacks at strength 6 and damage 2. And in that same article they also confirmed that the mechanic would surface on a bunch of other likely targets, cavalry which often get attacks with their hooves or with their bitey mouths for orc squigs and things. And they also mentioned that it would feature on the more general Carnifex datasheet, maybe representing something like the bone mace tails and things. Given that there's quite a lot of weapon profiles that basically already have this in 9th, I'd guess it's going to be fairly widespread. Maybe extra attacks for things like Mortarian's Attendants or the Mechadendrils and things that you might get on Tech Priests or Warpsmiths. It might be potentially the way that Servo Arms are represented as well. Overall, perhaps not exactly an enormous change this one, but I feel like it's a bit more simplified and streamlined rather than having to declare it on every single datasheet. So anyway, I hope you've enjoyed a bit more discussion of a whole bunch more 10th edition rules. Let me know your thoughts on these ones down in the comments below. Which of the changes and clarifications do you think are best and worst? And let me know if you think that these changes would have any particular impact on your army that I might not have covered. If you've enjoyed the video, then feel free to subscribe to All Specs Tactics, while I'll certainly keep the regular 40k videos coming. I do tend to post new ones just about every day. Finally, if you have been enjoying all the videos on the channel, I would just like to mention that Allspex Tactics does have a Patreon page as well, and you can find that linked in the video description below if you're interested in helping support. Channel patrons do get a fair few advantages, seeing certain videos early, regular votes to see what sort of things happen next on the channel, and automatic entry into the regular prize giveaways with a chance to win some big model kits each month. If any of that sounds good to you, or you'd just like to help support, the link is down in the video description. In any case, a massive thank you for listening, and I'll hope to see you guys next time.